Good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome to worship, and may God be with you. And also with you. Thank you. So welcome if you are watching from across the country, down the street, or seated here in the sanctuary. <laughs> welcome if you are young, young at heart, or somewhere in between. Welcome no matter what your economic status is. Welcome whether you couldn't wait to get here, if you're at home in your PJs, or you could barely get out of bed. Welcome if you are here every week, if you are here occasionally, you've never stepped foot in a church before, or somewhere in between. Welcome if you are gay, straight, transgender, or you identify some other way. Welcome if you are single, married, divorced, partnered, widowed, or something else. Welcome no matter your body shape or size, physical or mental ability. Welcome if you sing like the angels or not. Welcome, because no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. You make up the body of Christ and we could not be church without you. And what's more here in this place, you are a beloved child of God. There are members of the worship team in the back of the sanctuary who are able to assist you if you need any help or directions. A little later on in our worship service, we share our joys and concerns with one another. To facilitate that, we have prayer slips for your use and you will find those in the back of the pew in front of you. And uh, you can take this opportunity to fill those out and ushers will collect those a little bit later on. Our liturgist this morning is Laurel Pahalski, and our all, this morning's altar flowers were given by um, in loving memory of our parents and brother Todd from the Lay family. For those of you joining us in person today, please refer to your bulletin for other important announcements. Those of you who are watching from home, uh, we refer you to our Friday email. If you don't receive our Friday email, you can go to the church website at www.grovelanducc.org and you can sign up. It's also posted on our Facebook page every Friday morning. And in addition, you will find it posted on our Facebook page every Sunday morning right before worship. And so now, let us take a deep breath. Breathing in the breath, and the Spirit of God as we prepare our hearts and minds to worship God.
please join me in the call to worship. God calls us to this place, a haven for healing and hope. We come with the pain of our burdens. We come to hear God's word of hope. Together we will sing songs of joy. Each of us will hear God whisper our name, beloved of my heart. All join our voices in prayer and praise. Here our shadowed corners are filled with light. God's Spirit leads all people in peace.
Please join me in the prayer of gathering and confession. Because you dwell in our hearts, eternal God, you know how the anger, the pain, the bitterness of our lives try to crowd you out. The noise of the world deafens us to that word which can heal us. We want our children to be good, kind, and gentle to others. And then they hear us call others names and speak of them with demeaning words. Our desire for revenge towards those who have hurt us shows that your peace indeed is not in us. You promise a new heaven and a new earth. So create new spirits and new lives within us, healing God. Shattered by our sin, your heart can still heal our brokenness. Your spirit, living deep within our souls, can teach us faithful ways. Your word, Jesus Christ our Lord, whispers to us of your mercy, your hope, your love. Amen. Siblings in Christ, the word which can transform us is not some idle gossip, but good news for us. It fills us with forgiveness, equips us for service, and sends us forth to love others as God loves us. In our midst, the Holy Spirit teaching us all we need to know, gives us what we need in order to be faithful, and fills us with peace. Thanks be to God. Amen.
The New Testament reading is from Revelation 21, verses 10 through 25 and 5. He took me in a spirit-inspired trance to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. The city had God's glory. Its brilliance was like a priceless jewel, like jasper that was clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates. By the gates were 12 angels, and on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel's sons. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. The city wall had 12 foundations, and on them were 12 names of the Lamb's 12 apostles. The angel who spoke to me had a gold measuring rod from which to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. Now, the city was laid out as a square. Its length was the same as its width. He measured the city with the rod, and it was 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height were equal. He also measured the thickness of its wall. It was 216 feet thick as a person, or rather an angel, measures things. The wall was built of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like pure glass. The, city's wall, the city wall's foundations were decorated with every kind of jewel. The first foundation was jasper, the second was sapphire, the third was chaseldony, and the fourth was emerald. The fifth was sardonyx, the sixth was carnelian, the seventh was chrysolite, and the eighth was beryl. The ninth was topaz, the tenth was chrysoprase, the eleventh was jacinth, and the twelfth was amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was made from a single pearl. And the city's main street was pure gold, as transparent as glass. I didn't see a temple in the city, because its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. The city doesn't need the sun or the moon to shine on it because God's glory is its light and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there. They will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is vile and deceitful, but only those who are registered in the Lamb's scroll of life. Then the angel showed me the river of life-giving water, shining like crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb throughout the middle of the city's main street. On each side of the river is the tree of life, which produces 12 crops of fruit, bearing its fruit each month. The tree's leaves are for healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. They won't need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will rule forever and always. Our second reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called in Hebrew Bethsaida, which has five porticos. In these lay many ill, blind, lame, and paralyzed people. 
One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The ill man answered, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, stand up, take your mat and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. Here at the Spirit is saying to the church, thanks be to God. Please pray with me. O Holy One, pour out your Spirit among us wherever we are gathered or scattered. Have it move in, through, and among us, opening our ears, our hearts, and our minds to hear what you would have us hear through this, your servant. Amen. So it wasn't what I expected that summer. I took what they call a J-term class at seminary. The title of the course was White Privilege in the Church. I thought I had it all figured out. I thought, I, you know, privilege? I don't have any privilege. And boy, was I wrong. I learned about what it means to be a white person living in the world compared to being a black person in the world. And what it looks like or what the experience might be like for people of brown or black skin. You don't have to worry when I go into a store and have somebody kind of watch me the whole time thinking and assuming that I'm going to steal something. I don't watch people cross the street as I come down the street, the sidewalk, in order to avoid me thinking that I'm a thug, whether I am or not. It was probably one of the most painful experiences I've ever had in life. I know that that probably sounds really odd, but I didn't think that I had a trace of racism in me or any biases or prejudice. And I found out that I was wrong. But I was also able to figure out where it came from, the little that I did have and I could trace it through my family. I had forgotten that I grew up with a racist grandfather, and so whatever biases I still had came from that experience and that exposure. And I also realized that children are not born hating other people. They have to be taught. I read a story the other day about a nine-year-old boy who took a whip and went to the home of one of his classmates who was black. The little boy was white. He was going to whip her for being black. Where does this come from? Where did that child ever get the notion that being black was a bad thing. I was so confounded by that. It's like, why would you even teach a child something like that? We have a problem in our country. Jim Wallace, who used to be the editor of Sojourner's Magazine, wrote a book. He's it's also a pastor, he was also a pastor and a theologian. And it, the title of the book was called America's Original Sin. And he addresses the issue of race and slavery. This 
is such a difficult topic to talk about, but it's an important one. And the reason I'm talking about it today is because I've had enough. I've had enough. The latest episode in Buffalo has just done me in. There is so much hatred in this world right now, especially in this country, against people of brown or black skin, people who may be Asian, any number of things, people who are not white. When did we ever get the idea that being white made us better than anyone else? I have news. Spoiler alert, Jesus was not white. He was a Middle Eastern man with kinky, wiry hair and darker complected. And yet we see him portrayed in pictures and portraits everywhere with white skin, blue eyes, and long, flowy, light brown hair. I can't look at those pictures anymore and see Jesus. I see what white people have turned him into. The soul of our nation is at stake right now. We have become spiritually corrupt by our biases and by the racism that is so rampant. And it's a sin. You won't hear me talk about sin very much, but this is definitely a sin, a blemish on our souls, as the nuns used to tell us. Every time you sin, there's a black mark on your soul. <laughs> I don't believe that anymore. But I do believe that sin means that we turn away from God and God's intentions for us. And that's what plunges us if we continue into darkness. And I pray daily for people who have that much hatred in their hearts. And this hatred has no basis. We live in a very diverse world. If God did not intend to, for diversity, we would all look alike. And we believe, as Christians, that we are created in the image of the Imago Dei, in the image of God. That's each and every single one of us. And there is only one race, and that is the human race. The rest, we're just splitting hairs. We all came from essentially the same place, the cradle of civilization, the Middle East, in Africa, yes, Africa. I just had my DNA tested to find out my ancestry, and guess what? I have African ancestors from three different countries, three different areas in Africa. I was so surprised, but delightfully so. I was like, how cool is that? Right? Are you going to look at me differently now because somewhere along my genetic line, I have black blood coursing through my veins? Right now, there is something very frightening happening in our country. And it is called replacement theory. And I don't know how many of you have heard of it, but let me explain for those who haven't. There's a large segment of our population who believe that some force is bringing in immigrants and trying to replace all the white people with people of color, you know, people of other ethnicities, on and on and on. So that eventually white people will be the minority, which, you know, newsflash, we already are, um, and, um, or will be, become extinct. In my question, number one, that is not true. I hope you realize that that, that is not true. Number two, you know, people who want to come into this country, especially if they're coming from south of us, 
once occupied the land that we took. Just FYI. But it makes me think and ask this question. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, let me do this. So one day I was reading this woman who is kind of an expert on, um, on race and teaching about race and things like that. And she's a white woman. She said, okay, so we, we can all sit there and think, you know, that I, you know, that we're not, I'm not a racist. Everybody's the same. I treat everybody equally. And probably you do. But her question is, if you are not racist, would you be okay if you woke up tomorrow morning and you were black? Just think about that. I will tell you my answer. I would not be okay. And I will tell you why. Because my life would not be easy. It would be hard. And I would always be looking over my shoulder. And I would always be wondering, am I going to be in a grocery store someday and some hateful person is going to come in and shoot it up and I will die, leaving my children and my grandchildren? Why are so many people afraid of becoming the minority in this country? Because you know how you will be treated, or at least you're afraid that that's how you will be treated. I had a conversation with somebody once who, much to my surprise, was very racist and worried about immigration and all of these things. And I said, I don't understand it. You know, you're, you're a person of faith. You know, you should understand that everybody's equal in God's eyes. And I know who you are, and I know you have a good heart, and you're generous. And why, why, why? And he kept wanting to argue with me. Well, you know, they're going to take our jobs. Yeah, they want to go pick our, toma you know, pick our tomatoes because nobody else will do it. But finally, after going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, he finally admitted it's because they will treat us the way we've treated them. And I said, you are wrong. People just want to be treated equally and be glad that they don't want revenge. And who would blame them? The reading from Revelation this morning that Laurel read so beautifully, thank you, is a vision of what heaven can look like. I'll be honest, I hope heaven doesn't look like that. That does not interest me at all. <laughs> you know, I want something really pastoral with lots of beautiful trees and the, sh the stream of the water of life, that's perfect, right? But I think the idea and the hope is that it will be a place of peace and joy, full of love, where all the nations of the world are together, living in harmony and in peace. God wants that for this world, and Jesus showed us what that could be like if we would only listen, truly listen, and follow. The reading from John this morning. The title of it is Jesus Heals on the Sabbath, which is another topic for another sermon. But what jumped out at me this week was, do you want to be made well? What does that mean? Well, we think it's about being able to walk if we're lame like this man was, or being healed or cured of a disease. Well, there is a disease I would like this country to be healed from, racism. Do we want to be made well from this? Do we want to put the work in to get there? Right now, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but the church has a public relations problem. You know, we say 
that we welcome everybody. How many churches have you driven by that says all are welcome? It's a lie. How many church faithful Christians you hear out in public spewing the most hateful things imaginable? Why would anybody want to come to church? Why would a black or brown person ever feel safe stepping into any white church? Or anybody who's othered, for that matter. There was another shooting at a Taiwanese Presbyterian church in California. Somebody who hated Asian people. We've got to do better. We have to do better. So, what do we do? How do we go about this? Well, first of all, we have to all, every single one of us, admit that we have biases. And even though I have been doing anti-racist work for the last 13 or so years, it's, I'm still a work in progress. So don't think it's gonna happen overnight. We have to be committed and be in it for the long haul. Learn, learn where your biases have come from and be willing to challenge them and be willing to look at them, even if it's painful. And please, 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 and I cannot emphasize this enough, stop watching news. I don't care what side of the political fence you are on that has a slant or a bias. What do I mean? Think about Walter Cronkite. We all remember Walter Cronkite. Didn't we love Walter Cronkite? You never knew what he felt about anything because he just reported the news. He didn't tell you or scare you into believing something that wasn't true. That is not news. That is editorializing. And it is not of Jesus. And pray. Pray for God's compassion. Pray for God's wisdom. Pray for the courage to open your heart and your mind to seeing other people that are not like you exactly in different ways. To look at them the way that God looks at them. To look into their eyes. For I'm not saying we ignore the color of people's skin. We have to. We, of course we know it. We look at, you know, it, that's, not, that's not it. Oh, everybody's the same. I don't see color. You have to see color. And the reason that you have to see color is because if you are a different color than white, it matters, and not in a good way. And pray for the courage to give you the words to speak up when you are in a situation where somebody is making a racist joke or talking in a disparaging way So one more thing about that class that I took. So toward the end, it was like a two-week intensive class. It was, when I say intense, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. So at the end, there were, you know, the class was probably, I don't know, there weren't many, it was a small class because those summer and midwinter classes are always very small. There are only four white people in the class, and we were all women. And so my black colleague said to us, so now that your eyes have been opened and you understand this, what are you going to do about it? So I said, you know, well, I'm going to speak up. OK. I went home and checked my email, and there was one of those you know, emails that people send, they just send them to everybody on their email list. And it was about, oh, immigrants burning a flag in Texas or some sort of thing. And it was, I could tell that it was photoshopped and it was just ugly, it was terrible. And it was sent to me by a man in my home church, the church where I was ordained, who was on the committee to oversee my progress through seminary. I went, thanks a lot, Jesus. <laughs> So I sat there, I mean, 
Had I not had that class, I would have seen it and I would have just went, ugh, you know, and deleted it and just moved on. But I had just made a promise in front of my, my colleagues, my friends, my, you know, that I would speak up. So I sat there for a while and I prayed and then I composed a response telling him that I found it offensive and, you know, that I was in the, you know, finishing up a course on anti-racism, on and on and on, and um, that I just didn't feel that this was an appropriate thing for a Christian person to be spreading. And he responded, well, that seminary is just filling your head with a lot of nonsense. And you're just such a good, kind person, Robin, that you'll believe anything that people tell you. Well, you can call me a lot of things, but don't call me gullible and don't call me stupid. And so I responded and said, that is even almost as offensive as what you sent me, to think that I don't have a brain in my head, that I'm easily swayed and I can't critically think for myself. Not going to happen. I said, I think I'm going to pray for you. Fortunately, it didn't really have any effect on my standing within the church or I'm here, right? <laughs> but, and it didn't really affect our relationship because when other people in the church were anti-gay, I stood up because they have a gay child. They didn't have the courage to do it themselves. And it makes a difference. And even if it doesn't change things in the moment, your soul knows that you did the right thing. God knows that you did the right thing. And that's the only way we ever get anywhere, is if we are willing to stand up and speak up for those who have no voice. We are so fortunate. And when you have much, much is expected of you. I believe in you. I believe in us. Because God created us. I know the goodness is in there. I know the willingness to want to be better is within all of our capabilities. And we can do it together. We don't have to do it alone. And never, never, ever forget that when you are on the side of right, God is right there with you, cheering you on, and gives you the courage that you need. Amen? Amen. Amen.
This is the time in our worship service where we share our joys and concerns with one another and lift them up to God in prayer. Would the ushers please collect the prayer slips? Oh God, hear our prayers. For Mary Jane Sherborne, who's having surgery tomorrow. For the woman killed and child and man seriously injured in the car accident yesterday at the Byfield Greenhouse and Garden Center. Celebration for the 45 years of marriage to Chris. Like a fine wine, it gets better with time. Nancy Weil, congratulations. <laughs> Pray more prayers for Mary Jane Sherburn. For John LeBolt and his family on the death of his father. For the Paulette family, the death of Bob's daughter, Andrea. For Bob and Linda Paulette and family on the death of their daughter, Andrea. For Barbara Garwin on the death of her husband. We continue to pray for Ukraine and of course an end to racism and hatred. Let us spend some time with God in the silence of our hearts. Loving and faithful God, we are so grateful that we are able to come to you today just as we are. We are thankful that we can take off the masks that we sometimes present to the world and lay our souls bare before you. You accept us and love us no matter what. Thank you for that love and acceptance. We thank you too for commanding us to love one another as you love us because we often fool ourselves into believing that loving others is easy to do. In these times, you bring our attention to people who don't look or act like us. You point us toward people whose identities make us uncomfortable or we don't understand. And you even show us our enemies and tell us to love them too. You remind us of the times when we have not shown kindness and love to those closest to us in our lives. Turns out that loving others the way you ask us to is not as easy as it seems. Help us, patient God. Fill us with your compassion, understanding, and love. Enable us to be beacons of your light and love. Listening, God, as we give you thanks, we also come with petitions for healing and hope. We pray for safer communities where people can go without fear to grocery stores, churches, and other public places without worry of being shot. We pray for the families of shooting victims. Comfort them, God. Surround them with your peace. We pray, too, for an end to racism. Enable us to face our biases and see each and every human as beloved by you. We pray for our world, for refugees with no place to call home, for those who live in constant fear of their lives, 
for those who are hungry and for areas torn apart by war. Intervene, saving God. Impart your wisdom and love to our world leaders that they may do your will for all people who are your beloved children and give us bold voices to stand up to injustice. We ask you to hear the prayers of your people here today, whether spoken aloud or the ones that lay deep in our hearts that we cannot speak aloud. We pray all these things as we also pray the prayer Jesus taught us saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, with grateful and generous hearts, let us bring our offerings before God for the mission and ministry of Christ Church. We bring these gifts to you in order to share our bounty as you have shared yours with us. May those who need these gifts find your presence even as they receive what they need. May their paths of faith be lit with your light as ours have been. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
siblings in Christ, our worship is over, but our service has just begun. God has work for us to do. God has equipped us to do that work. Go out in the love and peace of the Christ to the call that God has put on our lives. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.